conflict series, covering recent major wars and crises, including this video's next part. Across the world, there's roughly 195 mostly internationally recognized countries. But within more than a dozen of these countries, from Mexico to the Congo to Yemen and to Myanmar and more, there are literally hundreds of rebel groups operating as well that the world map doesn't often show, each with their own agendas and each with their own territory they exert some kind of control over. They range in size from small-scale local insurgencies like the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, led by Joseph Kony, up to large-scale threats to the entire government government and order, like the Houthis in Yemen or the Free Syrian Army in Syria. And then, sometimes as in Afghanistan, a rebel group like the Taliban can eventually succeed in overthrowing the government entirely and becoming the new regime who operates the state. But what's fascinating is that regardless of the size, the scale, the location, the goals, or the ideology of all these different groups, it always turns out that there's one thing about them all that nearly always remains the same. The primary way they all make money to continue funding their operations. There are plenty of lucrative methods to choose from, like taking donations from sympathetic donors abroad, stealing resources like oil and rare earth elements, and then selling them to buyers who don't ask too many questions, selling and transporting illegal drugs, kidnapping and ransoming journalists, government officials, westerners, or other people who are perceived to have cash. Or, in a very creative method utilized by rebels in Somalia, opening up, opening up a criminal pirate stock exchange that anyone can theoretically invest in. In the town of Harathir, roughly in the center of the Somali coast, the Wall Street Journal reported back in 2011 that there were around 70 maritime piracy operations listed on the town's pirate stock exchange. Geographically, the Somali coast is well positioned nearby to the Gulf of Aden, a body of water that all vessels have to pass through as they enter or exit from the Suez Canal further to the north in Egypt, which is the primary trade route for everything traveling between Europe and Asia. As a result, some of the most valuable cargo in the world flows on ships traveling right next to Somalia. So, essentially, the entrepreneurial people of Hararad here figured out that they could fund their piracy missions into these valuable trade routes by offering up investment shares into operations that could be purchased with cash, gas, boats, or weapons. If the operation proved successful, then the investors would be paid out a portion of the pirates' profits. Once it was funded, the pirate mission would go out searching for their primary target, hostages on western cargo ships. Once taken, the pirates could earn up to a $4 million ransom from the ship's insurance company per job. And then, when successful, the pirates would return home and distribute the profits out to the mission's shareholders. Allegedly, one woman who invested in RPG-7 for around $500 on one of these missions received a $75,000 return on her investment from the pirates, a 150 times return on investment. Almost overnight, the impoverished town of Hararadhir suddenly became flooded with expensive luxury cars as the piracy investors reaped their rewards. This ingenuitive method of raising capital is similar, though, to methods used by rebel groups all across the world. Rather than fighting and risking lives and money to take over entire territories or cities, rebels, insurgents, and partisans the world over can instead finance most of their operations by simply taking control of strategic infrastructure like roads, bridges, highways, or, in the case of the Somali pirates, maritime trade routes. On land, it pretty much works like this. A rebel group desperate to advance their cause and in need of cash to finance their operations decides to set up a small checkpoint along a roadway with a few armed guards, along with some intimidating looking weapons. From there, the playbook is simple. They just demand a tax or a fee for everything and from everyone that passes through. And while that sounds pretty simple, this method literally makes billions of dollars a year for all of these groups across the world. And it's the primary way the nearly all all of them make most of their money, and the scale of these roadblock operations across the world can be truly staggering. Take the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or DRC, which is well known across the world for being one of the planet's most resource-rich countries. All on its own, the DRC contains 70% of the world's known sources of coltan, a vital metal that's used in electronics, as well as a third of the world's cobalt, nearly a third of the world's diamonds, and a tenth of its copper. In total, it's estimated that the total value 
value of the DRC's vast supplies of raw materials could be worth in excess of 24 trillion US dollars. Of course, there are some rebel groups operating within the country who are actively fighting with the government over the control of these valuable resources. But it's just so much easier and less risky to instead find a road, set up a roadblock, and begin taxing vehicles. Which is exactly why you end up seeing rebel checkpoints all across the DRC, including parts of the country that are far away from any valuable raw resources. It's the roads, along with the trucks and the people moving across them, that are the much more valuable and easier to control resource. An article from Foreign Policy written by Pierre Schauden, a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies, accurately mapped out more than 800 of these roadblocks across just two provinces in the DRC, North and South Kivu. That translates to roughly one checkpoint every 10 miles that people have to pass through. And in total, they bring in an estimated $50 million a year for the various rebels of the DRC, with around 120 different rebel groups operating such checkpoints and roadblocks blocks across the country, the DRC is a prime example of a fragile state, where the government hardly controls its own territory. In reality, on the ground, control of roads and highways are shared and disputed with these 120 different rebel groups. And the DRC is hardly the only example of this. Over in Central Asia, Afghanistan has been mired by conflict for decades, and the geography of the country is perfect for rebels to set up roadblocks at strategic choke points. The the entire country is covered by mountains and is therefore dominated by a single, circular highway that connects all of Afghanistan's major population centers together, and is pretty much the only path available to move between them. Therefore, it's incredibly easy for a group to set up a roadblock somewhere on the highway between Kabul and Kandahar, Afghanistan's two largest cities, which is exactly what's been happening here now for decades. During the Afghan Civil War, there were hundreds and hundreds of checkpoints and roadblocks set up all over the country by tons of different rebel groups and factions, which is partially how the Taliban first emerged to prominence during the 1990s, because they were vowing to destroy all of these illegal roadblocks that were getting set up by other rebels, which obviously easily and quickly won them the support of the Afghan truckers and traders, who became some of their most loyal and fanatical supporters. However, it wasn't long before the Taliban too learned how raising money through this method was just too easy, and pretty much beat every other option. So today, it's estimated that there are somewhere around 10,000 checkpoints and roadblocks set up all across Afghanistan. One of the country's most important routes from Herat to Kabul alone is estimated to bring in the Taliban nearly $200,000 a day from fees and taxes they collect. The same situation is largely true of Iraq, where all of the main roads are completely completely littered with roadblocks that finance fighters all across the country. And in true rebel entrepreneurial spirit, many of these rebel groups and factions inside of Iraq will literally lease the rights to operate certain checkpoints and roadblocks from the Iraqi government itself. And the same kinds of situations are taking place right now across Syria, Yemen, Myanmar, and Somalia, which is all around sort of the prime innovator space in the armed rebel financing sector. Al-Shabaab, a militant Islamist group operating within the country, has of course set up loads of their own roadblocks and checkpoints throughout the territory inside of Somalia that they control. But what separates them from other groups is that they'll make truckers pay taxes at only one of their checkpoints once, and then give them a sort of certificate that grants them safe passage through all of the other Al-Shabaab checkpoints in the country. And then, in order to make sure that the truckers stick only to their own routes, they'll just constantly attack all of the other routes that they don't control in order to ensure that all of them stay dangerous, while continuing to ensure that theirs remain open and safe. One of the greatest misconceptions in most modern conflict zones, and especially those controlled by rebel groups, is how, so often, the news will show territory they supposedly control in huge swathes. But in reality, as we've discussed, that's not really how any of this works. Most rebels, insurgents, or partisans only care about controlling the roads, and they're usually not really interested in the surrounding empty deserts, jungles, or mountains when there's no financial incentive there. The trade routes hold all of the value, and looting and pillaging them is where the money really is at. And to make matters even worse, Western companies and businesses are often just perpetuating this entire problem. Through nearly all of these checkpoints, everything is taxed by the rebels who control them, and that 
that includes, well, everything. And it doesn't exempt Western companies or aid organizations. In order to get around the stigma of paying money to armed, violent rebel groups in developing countries, these Western companies and aid organizations usually pull off a sort of loophole. They just don't pay the checkpoint taxes directly themselves. Instead, they'll hand off their logistics operations in these regions to local companies, who charge them a flat, upfront fee for all of their services, with all of the checkpoint taxes already priced in. That way, Western companies and aid organizations can claim that they simply don't really know what's going on in their outsourced logistics. It enables them to turn a blind eye to the rampant practice, and people in the West will generally never hear about it. Unless, that is, you're watching this video right now. So all in all, from roadblocks to piracy, there are many, many unconventional ways that rebel groups across the world can raise the funds needed to finance their operations. But unfortunately for so all in all, from roadblocks to piracy, there are many, many unconventional ways that rebel groups across the world can raise the funds needed to finance their operations.